for today is an associate professor, is a member of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences from the Department of Community Medicine and Primary Healthcare for years and ages. He's taught on research methods and uh, research methodology. And of course, he taught on that subject, the sample size. So tonight, this evening, he will be talking to us about that very important um, topic, the sample size. Dr. Daniel, sir, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Akiola. I hope I'm loud and clear. Yes, you are. Thank you so much. I was initially muted. Uh, so thank you for the introduction and uh, good evening, Dean of our faculty, Professor Wright. Thank you so much for this opportunity and the entire um, faculty management. Uh, my senior colleagues that are on the call, um, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, good evening all. Uh, so tonight we're going to be looking at the sample size. And this is a very <clears throat> important aspect of our research, especially when we're talking about the research methodology. Um, and once we don't get it right at this particular point in time, I mean, you are not likely going to get the right result and also make the right conclusion. Um, so I'll be talking to the following outline. Uh, we're going to be looking at what is sample and why do we sample? And then what is sample size? And then how do we go about determining the appropriate sample size for our studies? And then what are the considerations that we need to look at before we even start looking at computing the sample size for our studies. So we look at two scenarios, and then I'm gonna bring in a lot of examples to drive home my point, and then we're gonna conclude. Um, so what is a sample? So a sample is a smaller, but hopefully representative collection of units from a population used to determine the truth about that population. So essentially what we are talking about is you have a population, you have your study population, and then you take a sample. So for example, maybe you are looking at pregnant women in Lagos. That is your uh, study population or pediatric patient in Lagos. Um, it's not likely or it's not visible to be able to get all of them to study. And it's not even necessary. So you take a sample, and then you're now going to make inference, okay, in fact, on that population based on the sample that you have taken. So whatever result that you get, then you'll be able to infer it on the population. If you have taken the sample properly, and if you have taken the appropriate sample size. Um, so this is what a sample is. Just like if you want to test uh, the blood sugar of a patient, uh, it's not necessary to take all the blood from that patient to be able to say that we will be able to estimate the blood sample. We just, I mean, the blood sugar. We just take a sample. The same thing in uh, research. So we take a sample of the population so that we can make inference from the sample on that population. Now, why do we sample? So we obtain a sample rather than a complete uh, enumeration or census of the population for many reasons. Number one, it is usually very visible to work with a sample, okay? Uh, it's not usually visible to work with the whole population. So I just give an example now of uh, pregnant women in Lagos. It's not visible to be able to get all the pregnant women population in Lagos to study. So, and it's not necessary because you can take a sample. From your sample, you generate your statistics and then you can make inference on the parameter for uh, on that population. So visibility is number one. Number two, uh, to study the whole population, it's also gonna be very costly, okay? So to reduce the cost, you just take a sample, 
because you can estimate the results from the sample on the population, it is going to save you a lot of costs. And then greater accuracy. By the time you start looking for the whole of pregnant women in Lagos, you are going to lose a lot in terms of accuracy. Okay, so taking a sample helps us to get uh, better accuracy in our studies. And then speed, of course. Okay, so you'll be able to move faster. It can take years to be able to study the whole population. But if you are taking a sample, you'll be able to gain speed. So these are the reasons, few of the reasons why uh, we take a sample rather than looking at the whole population. But you must have a good sample. Okay, you must have a good sample because if you don't have a good sample that is representative of the population, then your results will not be valid. So there are three major factors that you have to look at when you are uh, when you want to work with a sample. Number one is your sampling procedure. So your sampling procedure must be scientific. Okay, you cannot just sample any. We have two major types of sampling uh, procedures. We have the probability and non-probability. That is beyond the scope of this uh, uh, class. So, but when you work with probability sampling technique, then it's, you are likely going to get a more representative uh, sample. So your sampling technique or procedure is very, very important in getting a good sample. Number two is your sample size, which is what we are working or looking at uh, this evening. So you must have an appropriate sample size. You don't just say, oh, I want to study 100 people, or I just want to study 200 people. I mean, it doesn't work like that. So you have to get an appropriate sample size to work with. And it has to also be scientifically determined. Okay, and then number three is the participation, the response rate. What is it gonna look like? Okay, because you have to also factor that into your uh, sample size uh, determination. Sometimes it's better to work with the whole population, especially when you have a population that is very small. So for example, if we are working with maybe children with, um, uh, pancreatic cancer in Lagos. Maybe they are not, the whole population may not be up to 100. So in that case, you may be able to work with the whole population rather than sampling uh, or rather than sample. And then when you do not uh, expect a very high response, yes, the population is not that big and you do not expect a very high response. It's better to work uh, with the whole sample. So apart from that, in most of what we're gonna be looking at or working on, uh, we will need to uh, sample and we need to sample appropriately. Now, so I've talked about sample and then I've talked about why it is important. And I've told you that you must get your sampling technique right and then you must be able to also determine your minimum sample size. So what is sample size and why is it important? Uh, just to emphasize, the minimum number of subjects that you need to assure a given probability of detecting a statistically significant effect of a given magnitude if one truly exists. So our study is trying to assess uh, an effect, uh, a relationship, an association, or whatever you are trying to assess with your study. If that effect or association or relationship exists in the population, you need a minimum number of subjects, okay, that will help you to be able to detect that difference if that difference really exists. So that is the reason, that is essentially what uh, uh, sample size is uh, all about. And this is important because it's a crucial component of the study for you to have sufficient number of subjects so that you can statistically, uh, uh, so that you can get a statistically significant result if one is there, okay? So it's important. So most review committees will not even take your, uh, your proposal if you have not properly determined the appropriate sample size. And of, and of course, most funding uh, agencies or, or organizations will not even consider that proposal as well. So it's a very, important aspect of our research methodology. So 
how do we go about uh, sample size? How do you determine the appropriate number of subjects that you need to work with in your studies? Now, before we go into that, you must answer the following question. You must you know, look at the following considerations, okay? Before you even talk about determining the, uh, the minimum sample size, because these questions are very, very key to helping you determine the appropriate uh, sample size. The first question here is, you have to know the primary objective of your study. What is the primary objective of this study? And of course, from the objective, you get your research questions, and you also have to state your hypothesis, the hypothesis of the study. So if the study is to look at the proportion of uh, pediatric patient with um, uh, or pediatric population with uh, high blood pressure in Lagos, that can be the objective. So you have to set your objective and then also state the hypothesis of the study because you will need this to uh, to determine which uh, which formula or which path to uh, sample size determination you're going to follow. So it, this is very very important. Another thing that is important apart from you know, um, establishing your objective and hypothesis is the study design that will help you to answer these objectives, okay? You also have to be clear about your study design because this is also important for the determination of the minimum sample size. Another thing that is important is your main outcome measure. What is the variable of interest that you are looking at? So in the example I just gave, the, my variable of interest is, uh, uh, proportion of uh, uh, hypertension, that's uh, prevalence of hypertension among pediatric population. If that is, I have to be clear about my outcome measure. Sometimes you may have more than uh, one outcome measure. So you have the primary and then you have secondary outcome measures, but you have to be very clear about that. You will see how this comes to play, you know, in the examples as we move forward. And then another thing that is important, another thing that is important is uh, what type of variable is that outcome measure? So basically we have two types of variables. You have a categorical variable, which some people call uh, qualitative variables. And then you have numerical variables, uh, which some people call quantitative variables. So this is also important in determining uh, your minimal sample size. So you have to know the type of variable you are dealing with. In the example I just gave, that is a categorical variable. Of course, you will see in the uh, examples that we're going to be giving uh, going forward. Now, number fifth thing that is important that you have to consider before you even go about determining your sample size is how will the data be analyzed to detect a group difference? So you are looking for an effect or change how will you analyze? Because there are several statistical analysis uh, technique and those, I mean, that is important in also determining your uh, minimum sample size, okay? So number six, how small a difference is, clinical, is clinically important to detect, okay? So if your clinical effect that's the, uh, the clinically important uh, effect that you want to detect is small. Of course, that means you're going to need a large sample size. If it is large, you will not need that much uh, large sample size. So it's important to also know that, you know, before uh, you decide to, you know, calculate your minimum sample size or determine your minimum sample size. Number seven, how much variability is in our target population? So looking at your outcome measure. So we also need that information, you know, to be able to determine the sample size. And then what is your desired alpha and beta? Of course, you know, alpha in the in hypothesis testing is the type one error. So that's the probability of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when it is actually true. So um, so the probability of making that error is like 5%. You have to factor it, usually 5%. You have to factor it, that into your sample size determination. And then you look at beta. Beta is the type two error in hypothesis testing. I'm sorry, I may not be able to go into so much details 
into several things that connect to sample size determination, but we can take note of some of those things and then we can look at them later. I will just try and explain them briefly and then we can look at them later. Uh, because they are important to sample size determination, that's why I'm bringing them up here. If not, they are beyond the scope, the scope of uh, this lecture. So beta is the type two error. That's the probability of failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is actually false, okay? And then one minus beta is your power, which is the probability of detecting a difference if one exists in, in, in that uh, in that test, uh, in that uh, your data set, in your observation. So you must also um, you must also define or make decision about uh, these items before you go ahead to data because you're going to need their inputs into the determination of your minimum sample size. And lastly, you also have to anticipate dropout uh, or non-response rates in the study. So you have to anticipate what is the what is going to be the response rate in the study. So all these uh, things, all these items are very, very important to the determination of your minimum sample size. Now, before I go into examples, let me just, you know, define some terms. You know, for example, I talked about alpha. That's the type one error. And that is, we normally set that uh, uh, the alpha is also your significance level. That's the level at which you reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis in your hypothesis testing. And then I've talked about power, which is one minus type two error. And the, that is the probability of detecting any difference uh, if anyone exists in, in the study. Uh, so I'm going to be coming back to some of these things as we move along. That's why I'm trying to you know, uh, talk about them before, before we, we go uh, forward. Then the clinical effect size, I think I also mentioned that before. So that's the size that is clinically important that must be detected um for uh in the study okay and that is uh what the power is going to be trying to detect to see whether that effect is there or not so we need to also uh decide on the clinical effect side before we go into sample size uh in, into the calculation and then we talk about one tail or two tail test okay so you also have to decide whether your uh your test or your study is one tail or two tail, okay? So one tail has to do with uh, when your, your um, so how will I put it now? When, when there is a direction to your research question. So let me put it that way, to your test, there is a direction. So let, let me give an example now. So for example, if we are checking a new drug that we believe will, improve the outcome of um, uh, people living with HIV. So we are just trying to see a, a new drug. Uh, so if our research question is to see whether the effect will be, uh, the, the effect is improvement. So this will improve the outcome, okay? That is a one directional, um, a one directional test. Unlike if uh, you are just looking at, is there any difference? Will the drug make any difference? So you are not sticking out your neck to say whether it will improve or uh, decrease, or it will be uh, higher or lower or, or, th or things like that. So you are just saying, is there gonna be any difference? So that will be a two-tail uh, a two -tail test. So there is no direction in, in that, uh, in your research question and in your hypothesis testing. So this is also important, you know, because it's going to be required for uh, the calculation of the minimum uh, sample size. Um, uh, so for, for example, if you look at this table, uh, the alpha error, uh, sorry, the alpha error at uh, 0 0.052 tail, we give us the standard normal devi uh, deviate of 
compared to one tail, which will give you 1.64. Okay, so these numbers, you will see how important they are as we move on. So this is how one tail or two tail, uh, alpha, beta error, uh, significance level, power, and so on and so forth come to play in the determination of uh, your minimum sample size. So uh, before I go, uh, before we move into the, some of the examples, I also need to state this. You can determine or estimate your sample size uh, via three ways. It can be via using the formula, the sample size determination formula, which I normally suggest because if you know how these things work practically, then when you are using a software, you have a better understanding. It's like somebody who has a better understanding of the back end. He knows how these things come to play. And then when they are using the system, they will be able to know how the result come to play. So I normally insist that not, I mean, most of the time I tell my students, you must also learn about all the formulae, even though we have software that can help you to calculate uh, your minimum sample size. And of course, we also have the sample size table or nomogram that can help you to estimate your minimum uh, sample size. So let's look at two scenarios, okay? So in um, determining your minimum sample size, we look at scenario one, when you are uh, working, uh, when your studies uh, design is descriptive. So, of course, you remember when we're talking about the different types of study design, we have observational study design, we have experimental or interventional study design, and then under observational study design, we have descriptive study design or analytical study design. Generally, for the purpose of this class, we're just going to work with descriptive study design, analytical study design. So even for some experimental studies, I'm also going to work um, put them under analytical study design. So you have to know your study design, just like I said, for you to be able to determine your minimum sample size. So if you, your study design is a cross-sectional study, for example, the next thing is, is it a categorical outcome or numerical outcome? So let's look at an example. So for a categorical outcome, this is the sample size formula for determining a categorical outcome. So you have the Z alpha square times P in bracket one minus P divided by D square. So what is Z alpha? That is our standard normal variance at type one error, just like I said. So that is important for the determination of sample size, like I said. So at type one error of 0 0.05, the standard normal deviates would be 1.96. Uh, standard normal deviate is just the normal distribution. It's just like your, you get that from the normal distribution table or your Z uh, distribution table, um, which I'm not going to go so much into details, you know, uh, in, in this class. So, uh, so we know our Z alpha. So if we are working with uh, alpha error of 0 0.05, which is usually what most studies work with. So your standard normal deviate will be 1.96 at that point, okay? As a majority of the studies, p-values are usually considered at minus 0 0.05. So 1.96 is used in our formula. P is the expected proportion in the population of the outcome, uh, the proportion of the outcome in the population. And you can get this from previous studies. So if I'm looking at, uh, for example, this example we are looking at now, uh, hypertension in pediatric age group in Lagos, for example. So from previous studies, we can look at other people that have worked on this, on similar uh, uh, subjects, uh, studies, and then we'll be able to work with their own proportion. So that's what you're going to use in your uh, as your P. And then uh, uh, D is the absolute error of precision, which is the same thing as your alpha uh, error. So whatever your alpha error is, is going to be your D. They also call it the margin of error. 
uh, in your study. So these are the parameters that we're going to put together to be able to determine the minimum sample size for a categorical outcome variable. So let's look at this example that I've put here now, that a researcher wants to estimate the proportion of patients having hypertension in pediatric age group in a city. So according to previous, previously published studies, actual number of hypertension may not be more than 15%. So the researcher wants to calculate the minimum sample size with a precision or absolute error of 5% and type one error of 5%. 5 okay? So what would be the minimum sample size? So just like I said, your Z alpha will be 1.96 squared. Our proportion from previous study is 0 0.15 and one minus 0 0.15. And then D is our 0 0.15. By the time you put all of that together, you get a sample size of 196. Okay, so that would be the minimum sample size. Well, remember I told you that uh, we're also going to, part of, part of what you uh, factor into the determination of your sample size is your response rate, okay? So let's assume that our response rate for this study is going to be uh, 90%. So we also now adjust our minimum sample size based on that. So your number to a role is equal to desired sample size divided by your response rate, the percentage of your response rate. So for 90%, our minimum sample size adjusted now will now be 196 divided by 0 0.9, which will now be 218. So this is how to calculate minimum sample size for a categorical outcome for a cross-sectional study. Let's look at a numerical outcome. So it follows the same principle, but the only thing here is because it's a numerical outcome, you are not going to be having proportion because it's not categorical. You get proportion or prevalence from uh, a categorical variable, but you get your mean or uh, standard deviation, which is a measure of variation uh, from your numerical uh, outcome. So that is what is gonna change here. So we, instead of P, we're just gonna be having standard deviation of the variable, which you also get from previous studies, okay? so. Um, in this case now, we are not working with proportion with hypertension, we're just working with average systolic blood pressure, which is a numerical outcome. okay? So we work with, uh, from previous study, we discovered that the uh, standard deviation is uh, 25 millimeter mercury, and then we factor that into uh, the formula, and then we get uh, a sample size of 96. And then to uh, adjust for non-response, we uh, apply the same formula and then we get 107. So that is for a cross-sectional uh, study. Now, another thing you have to factor <laughs> into your sample size uh, determination is the total population in question. So if your total population is less than 10,000, then you also have to adjust accordingly based on this formula. So for example, if, for, uh, for example, the total population of pediatric age group in that community, maybe we are using at the community now, they are less than 10,000, then you have to adjust your minimum sample size using this formula. It's quite straightforward. Another thing you have to consider when that you also have to factor into the determination of your sample size is what we call the design effect, especially when you are doing your sampling, you are you you are uh, using a, a a cluster uh sampling technique. There's some measure of a, a cluster um uh effect or you, you, maybe part of your sampling technique is uh, uh, using usage of cluster uh, sampling tech. So in that case, you have to also factor in the design effect into the equation. Um, it's for you to just take note of this because I may not be able to go fully into it. I have less than one hour to deliver this uh, lecture. So please, let's just take note uh, of that as well. So let's look at scenario two. This time around, we are now working with uh, analytical studies. Okay, of course, 
we have different types of analytical studies. You have case control studies, you have core studies, you have comparative studies when you are comparing me or you are comparing your proportions. Uh, you we have the experimental studies. So analytical studies basically is when you are dealing with two groups. Okay, for most of our descriptive uh, studies, you just have one group. But once you have another com com comparative group, okay, maybe as a control or whatever, so the study becomes analytical in design. Okay, and when you have that kind of design, the way you go about your sample size determination will also uh, change. So let's look at examples. Okay, so when we have a case control studies, Again, I may not be able to go into details of these study designs. I'm, I'm sure that we should be another class to expatiate on the different uh, study designs that we have. Uh, but for case control studies, you have two groups. One group, the case, and the other group, the control. And the case has the problem that you are looking at, maybe a disease or whatever that you are looking at, and the control does not have that. And then you now look back to look at the risk factor that might, have, that might have been responsible for what you are now looking at in uh, the cases. So that is basically what the design. So it's more of a retrospective study, and you have two groups, and you are looking at uh, estimating, you know, um, risk, just to estimate the risk of that, the risk factors for for. The, uh, for the problem or for the disease that is under study. So for that, for this kind of design, this is the formula. Follows the same principle. The only thing here is because you have two groups, you have to also factor that into the equation. And then because you have two groups, so R, yeah, so if you look at the sample size uh, formula, you have R plus one divided by R, and then in bracket P asterisk, bracket close and then open bracket again one minus p asterisk and then your z uh, z beta plus z alpha square divided by p1 minus p2 square so what is r r is the ratio of control to cases so when you are looking at equal number so for example if we are looking at equal number of case and control our r will be one so it's one to one, so one over one, which is one. So um, that is R. So it's just looking at the ratio of control to cases. What is P asterisk? That is the average proportion exposed. So proportion exposed in the cases plus proportion exposed in the control. All this you get, uh, for example, the proportion here you get from previous studies or from your pilot study, okay? And then you divide. So that you, for you to be able to estimate, because this is what you want to carry out, but to be able to uh, estimate your minimum sample size, you have to get those values, maybe from previous study or from a pilot study. So that is how to get your P asterisk. And then Z beta is the standard normal variate for power. So usually I said something about power the other time. I said power is the probability that your test will detect a difference in that uh, in those observations if any difference or effect is there okay so usually we set power at 80 percent that you have the test you have at least 80 percent uh, probability to detect any difference if one exists in that population so at 80 percent power your standard normal variate will be 0 0.84 some people can move it to 90%, some that they want the power to be higher. Of course, when you increase the power of the test or of the study, the sample size will also increase. So, uh, so you must have that uh, in mind. So the researcher has to select whatever power that they want to work with. And then I've talked about uh, Z alpha before. And the effect size, I think I also mentioned this, so that will be the difference in the proportion of the exposed minus the proportion of uh, the proportion exposed among the cases minus proportion exposed among the control. Okay, so the different 
the difference is the effect size. Okay. So by the time we uh, put all of this together, you'll be able to calculate your minimum sample size for a case control study. So let's look at an example here. A researcher is interested in the link between childhood uh, sexual abuse with uh, psychiatric disorders in adulthood, and he wants to fix power of the study at 80%, and assuming expected proportion in case group and control group are 0 0.35 and 0 0.20, respectively. Of course, this he will have gotten from a previous study or from a pilot study. So he wants to have an equal number of cases and control. So what would be the sample size? So the sample size, we just plug it in. Uh, R is one because it's equal number, which is one plus one, which is two, divided by R, which is one. Uh, P asterisk will be, uh, we have said the average. So we just add these two, 0 0.35 plus, is 0 0.2 divided by 2. That will give us the P asterisk. So that's 0 0.275. And then we 1 minus P asterisk. And then our power is uh, at 80%. So that's the standard normal deviate at that level is uh, uh, standard normal variate at that level is 0 0.84. And um, for uh, for alpha error, it's going to be 1.96. And so we plug in all this. And at the end of the day, we have 138.9 as the minimum sample size for each, for each group. So it's quite simple once you understand what you are doing. And then for a numerical outcome for case control studies, uh, just like I said initially, Okay, I will come back to all the questions. I think we should just keep those questions coming. So just like we said uh, initially, uh, here, yeah, instead of using proportion, we are using standard deviation. Okay, so, and then you get that standard deviation from the previous studies, and then you plug it in. So look at an example here. Okay, a researcher wants to say the association between birth weight and diabetes in adulthood. If the researcher thinks that the difference in mean a mean weight between case and control may be around 250 grams, and standard deviation, one kilogram. Then considering equal number of cases and control at 80% uh, uh, power, the sample size will be this. So we just plug it in now. Uh, um, our standard deviation from previous studies is one, so we just put one there, one square. And then by the time we work this out, we get uh, 250. So that will be 250 for each case and control. So the same thing applies. The same thing applies to core studies. Okay, you get the formula. Of course, core studies. You also have to understand how core studies, uh, uh, core studies are designed. Okay, uh, so let me just go straight to the. I mean, because we've all literally explained all these items before. Maybe uh, apart from him. So in this formula now, we have another item coming in. That's M. So that's the number of control subjects per uh, experimental subjects, just like your how that you have uh, uh, before. So, and then our P asterisk here has a different formula. So once you just get all these items, you know, uh, uh, once you get, just have, all these items are, uh, uh, at hand, you can just plug them in and you'll be able to get your minimum sample size. So let's look at an example for a core study here. So a researcher wants to see the impact of weight training exercise on cardiovascular mortality. And according to previous studies, proportion of cardiovascular deaths in case may be around 20% and in control, to be around 40%. Hence, the sample size calculation for 5% of significant level and 80% power with equal number of study uh, and control group will be what? So we have our formula. Z alpha is 
1 plus 1 uh, over m. I've told you that the number of control per express. So since it's the same number, just like our how in the case control is 1, so we plug it in. The proportion um, for uh, so we, we plug in all the other items. So we have, uh, so this is our P, uh, P asterisk. So P2 is uh, 20 plus one uh, times P1, which is uh, uh, 40 divided by one plus one. And then that will give you 0 0.3. Okay, so, and then you plug in all those items. We already have our power, uh at 80 percent 0.84 and then we plug in all the other items okay so by the time we put in all of this uh we'll be able to get our minimum sample size which is 59.41 so that will be the uh, minimum sample size for each group for this course study let me just walk one more example on the analytical study because of time uh, and this is also a very common studies that we, okay, maybe maybe two more, but common studies, common studies that we normally have, that's comparative studies. So is that you are comparing me or you are comparing proportions? So for example, if you have a, a two, uh, maybe an experimental uh, group and a study group and then a control group, or the placebo group, and then we administer an intervention to see whether the blood sugar will reduce. Um, on the other hand, uh, compared to the placebo. So those are two groups, and then the outcome, you are comparing between those two groups. Okay, so, and the outcome can either be a categorical variable or a numerical variable. So in this case now, where we are working with uh, the outcome, a categorical variable outcome, so this is the formula. So we just, uh, we already know what is Z alpha. We know what is Z beta. We know our proportion. Proportion one is for the first group. Proportion two is for the second group. And then you have your effect size here. Okay. So, and then this is the example. A researcher wants to design a study in which two medications are compared. The first group are seen as an improvement of 40%. The researcher wants to see if the newer drug will improve this by 10%. So they designed a study, assuming a study with power 80%, power of 80% and a two-sided significant level of 5%. How many participants are required to detect a difference of 10% between the two groups? So by the time we plug in all the numbers, 1.96, 0 0.84, and then P1 is 0 0.4, and then P2 will be 0 0.5, because you had 10% to it, and then the difference will be 0 0.1, and then we'll be able to get a sample size of 384 per group. Okay, so very simple uh, indeed. And then if it is a numerical outcome, it follows the same principle. Okay, so you say your sample size, this time around you are working with standard deviation, and then you plug in, you plug it in, and then you get your minimum sample size. Okay, so uh, quite straightforward when you know exactly what you are doing. Now, for randomized clinical trials, so I've done for cross-sectional studies, you know, uh, uh, we've done for case control studies, cohort studies, and then comparative studies generally, and straightforward even uh, clinical trials. So when you just have two groups, but you also have different uh, variants of clinical trials. Those ones we also come with, they are different uh, sample size determination strategies, okay? So for example, you have equality trials, you have equivalence trials, non-inferiority trials, superiority trials. So we don't want to go into details of these things so that we're not complicate things, but it's important for us to note that each of these study designs, we have their different uh, methods of determining their minimum uh, sample size. So I just put all the formula here so that in case you are interested or you are working on one type of study or the other, you'll be able to know which formula to use. Okay. Um, 
I also said that we can determine a minimum sample size using the normal gram. Okay, so this is an example of a normal gram. Of course, it will also factor in the power, your significance level, and the standardized difference or the clinical difference, uh, uh, effect size that you are looking at. So, and then from there, you'll be able to work out your minimum sample size. And lastly, you can determine minimum sample size using uh, a software uh, for sample size determination. So let me just look at an example here. Let me see if this one will open. Okay, Dr. Akiola, please confirm that you can still see my screen. Yes. Okay, so this is an example of the software. Of, we have several, of course, you have several online. So if I want to calculate for proportion, for example, so I will just go there. So this is sample size for proportion. So I just want to see uh, two proportions. So I go there, enter my new data, um, the population size. So let's say the population size is definitely more than 10,000. So let me just put uh, 1 million. So let's say the anticipated proportion, maybe from previous studies, let's just put 45. Um, and then our... Uh, significance level, let's leave it as 5%. And let's just leave the design effect as, as one. So you can calculate your sample size. So it will just calculate. So at 95% confidence level, your sample size is 381. At 80% one, and so on and so forth. So it can help you to calculate for different, uh, for different study. And then we have quite a lot of them. So there are some are simpler, some may be not be able to capture all the different uh, designs that you are looking at, but in all, you'll be able to get uh, around uh, from this different platform. You'll be able to get what you are looking at, I mean, from this different different platform. I just want, want to open another one, yes. So this is another one, we call it FP tools. Okay, so from here, you can also calculate uh, your sample size. Okay, so uh, so like we said, you have to know exactly what you are looking for. So let's say we want to estimate two proportions like that one as well. So we put it here, you put your proportion one, maybe 0 0.4, proportion two is 0 0.6. Uh, the ratio, like I said, is one. So we want equal number for each group. Our confidence level is 95. That's our alpha error is five. Okay, so, and then your desired power is 0 0.8. So if it is one tail, you pick one tail. If it is two tail, you pick one two tail, and then you submit. And then it will help you uh, to generate your sample size. Okay, so, so these are the results. So sample size one, 107, sample size two, 107, and total 214. Okay, so we have those two, but it's important to, you know, understand the back end. That's why I have to take us through, you know, the process, you know, how all these things uh, come about. Uh, so let me go back to my lectures. Okay. So what are the key takeaways as I ran, ran off? Number one. Number one, you must define your research objective. For you to be able to get your appropriate sample size, you have to define your research objective. You have to know what exactly you want to achieve. Your research questions must be properly constructed. Your hypothesis must be properly constructed. You must know exactly what you want to test. You must know the design, the study design that will help you to answer these questions. You must know the outcome variables, just like you have seen. What is your variable of interest? You have to understand this. You have to know the type of statistical analysis that will help you to detect any difference or association or whatever you are looking at, you know, appropriately. You have to de decide on the type 
of difference or change that you want to detect. Uh, you have to choose your desired alpha. Like I said, normally, you normally choose 5% uh, conventionally, and then 80% uh, for beta, and then you now use appropriate equation uh, to answer your sample size. I mean, this is a big subject, but I just have to find a way to summarize it to what I think is important, very important, uh, uh, very, very important for us to know. So thank you so much for your attention.